Hi, it's Ian from the Postal Hub Podcast. And Marek from Last Mile Experts. And we are The Last Mile Profits. This is the last word on The Last Mile. Marek, Singapore, the island nation. Been some news there with Alibaba and its logistics spreading its tentacles into the last mile there. That uh, sounds ominous, Mr. Kerr. Well, well, you know, we always portray things as good news. Why don't we say it's bad? It's not bad news. It just means that there's more competition and more developments here in the last mile. Now, Alibaba, before we get into this, Alibaba owns a share in Singapore Post already. So this latest announcement that um, Alibaba's making these partnerships through its logistics in Singapore is interesting news in what that might mean for cross-border parcels, competition the last mile. You're nodding your head. I think I'm giving you a run-in for something here. Matic, you're a keen on this topic. What's what's your take on it? Amadeep, for me, the big picture, and this is what I find really exciting about this, is the fact that the Chinese will would appear to be doing something similar to what they've done in China, i.e., my favourite one, an open network. And Which already exists in Singapore, of course. There's the, the government set up the partnerships between various par- parcel locker operators. Yeah, there's a locker. There's a locker network. I think it's fairly embryonic at the moment. The, the whole idea of open networks at any scale happened behind the Great Wall. So the Hivebox is a huge open network. And if I'm not mistaken, we were talking about this recently. China Post even joined recently. So everyone who's anyone is there. So, so this uh, but this not last mile network under the Kainyao, and I'm sorry if I've mispronounced that, everybody, Kainyao network banner is, it says 1,600 collection points, 600 couriers, and 500 lockers. And it's doing, achieving this via partnership with Singapore Post, Best Inc., Road Bull, which is a logistics last mile carrier, and Park and Parcel. And I interviewed the CEO of Park and Parcel a couple of years ago on the Postal Hub podcast. Park and Parcel, Mark, is this idea where you have a nominated neighbour, shall we say, in your apartment block who will receive parcels on your behalf. A similar thing's being done in Germany with... We only talked about it a couple of weeks ago. Well, oh, my the, the goodness. One that I'm aware of that's a bit similar as Hermes, which is this lifestyle courier type thing, isn't it? Yeah, so the idea is that it's delivered to, the parcels are delivered to your neighbour and they will get you be paid a small fee for looking after your parcels and then you collect the parcel. So, which I love because it's all part of the sharing economy. Wow. Well, I know you're big on it, Matic. And there's a whole process that they have to go through, they, the park and parcel people, go through to approve someone to be a recipient so that they don't unwittingly approve someone who might just nick all the parcels, right? Absolutely. Which is, which is not, not, not an ideal outcome from a uh, customer experience perspective. Anyway, there's the background, Matic. Now, what, you've been giving this a bit of thought. Yeah, I think, I think for, first of all, high level, number one, what is really exciting about this is it's another place where you've got an open network and this sharing economy type scenario, which I think is the future. Because there is no way, and this is what our friends in China realized, as you remember, five years ago, there is no way to deal with the e-commerce capacity issue without doing something like this. So I think <clears throat> that's super smart. I think it's great that it's in Singapore, which is a high-tech country, but let's be honest, as you called it, the island nation, it's manageable. It's not so big, either in terms of geography or in terms of population. Well, I, th- I think the key point here, though, for, for Singapore is that they've got uh, real concerns about things like congestion and even air quality so if there is a way to reduce the number of vehicles on the road and we've had this discussion before about reducing the number of kilometers driven by using whether it's pudos or out of home delivery options so i think that's a factor in there as well Matic. absolutely and and i think any smart and let's be honest resident centric if we paraphrase an amazonian term government will seek to find ways to make people have a better living climate and standard And I think this is what's cool here. There are other examples. It's beginning to happen in Salzburg. As you know, Infost is doing something with Salzburg City. We know that our friends at Transport for London are continually looking at what they can do to improve the last Uh, mile environment. B-Post is doing something as well. I'll be featuring that on the Postal Hub podcast in October. So stay tuned for that one. There we go. You're a busy bee, Mr. Kerr. I have to be, Maddox. I have to keep. <laughs> to be busy right away, which is a whole other story we won't go into right now. But there are all these pushes, whether it's by a city, by a carrier, or by an e-commerce player, to 
have these out of home options to reduce the congestion, reduce emissions and kilometers driven and so on and so forth. What and is this? And, it's, and that's the big thing, because all, all the other things are secondary. The big thing is that this is part of a step change. And Singapore, as one might expect from such a progressive nation, is at the forefront. So let's see what happens, because for me, the key question is, who else is going to jump on the bandwagon? Well, I, I was actually going to ask not so much about bandwagon jumping, but about competition and things like that. Now, if Alibaba grows its delivery capabilities in Singapore, does that mean it's going to be growing its e-commerce volumes going into Singapore? I mean, it's not doing this just because it had nothing to do on a Thursday. I mean, it's, 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 there is a strategy behind this, right? But remember, Ian, the more agnostic the network, and this is the key thing, and I, I would expect, based on what we've seen in Singapore, that the government's going to seek to make things fairly open and very effective from a last mile perspective. If that's the case, then I believe that this is good news for everyone because it's going to be great for the big Alibabas, the Amazons, but also for the smaller players because e-commerce means you need an efficient delivery system and post-COVID more so than ever. And if that doesn't happen, then it's bad for retail in general. So from my perspective, I think that's the, 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 the big picture issue here. I think it's great they're doing it. It's very early days, so let's see how it develops. But I'm sort of cautiously optimistic, given Alibaba's track record in that part of the world. Well, let's let's then look. Let's look at the Southeast Asia region. Singapore is a hub there, and obviously you know, it's, it's one market. But if Alibaba gets it right there. What's to stop Alibaba then going to Kuala Lumpur, Bangkok, wherever else it might be in the region to make the same play? Because there's a lot of innovation happening in Southeast Asia. We don't hear a lot about it in in you know, the English speaking world, but there are lots of startups there in things like ride sharing and all these sorts of things. Your sharing economy, Mark, you'd love it. And various acquisitions happening at the same time to, to well, continue. Yeah, if you've been reading the press recently, as I know you do, Ian, you know, the, the Chinese have been buying left, right and centre, uh, both within their domestic market and, and looking more and more within the region. So I think this is one to watch. What will be interesting is to review this in about a year's time, see where it finally got to. I have no doubt that it will be successful for two reasons. Number one, if Alibaba volumes are behind it, then it, it cannot fail to have the, the, the volume. And the second thing, I think, is looking at the footprint. I think you mentioned there's going to be about 2,000 or more uh, individuals. 1,600 collection points, it says, so straight away. And there there was something else. I think there was, was, wasn't there something like 400 lockers? 500 500 lockers, according to this. It's got over 2,000 for a population of five and a bit million. So if you remember my MVP rule, which would be about 550,000, that's 550, sorry, machines, and they're going to have 2.1K. So... Let's watch this space. I think it's going to do pretty well. And then on top of that, we've got the initiatives from the Singaporean government. So, Marek, plenty to ponder here. What's happening in Singapore? What it might mean for the rest of the region? What learnings they might take out of this for other markets? I know there are a couple of very well-connected people in our network, Marek, who might want to comment below to give us their hot take on what all this means for the last mile in Singapore and the last mile around Southeast Asia. Marek Krzyzewski, thanks for being part of the Last Mile Profits today. Thank you, Ian. Thank you, everyone.